The discovery and restoration of the Gronauer Lock is a tale of resourcefulness and dedication. A story of the same kind of determination shown by the iron-willed workers who shaped these massive timbers over 150 years ago. It's an adventure with more twists and turns than the canal route itself. Harold Gehrig had always been fascinated by the lock. His father had taken him on his first search for canal artifacts when he was only eight years old. In 1991, while driving home, Gehrig saw highway workers in New Haven digging an interchange where the lock once operated. If the lock was buried in the right-of-way, highway crews would demolish it the next day. I need some help tonight. I know it's late, but... Working quickly, he and his father got a stop work order issued, but just for three days. But that was time enough for Canal Society members to determine that the ditch did, in fact, contain lock timbers. Oh, now our lock is discovered. Archaeologists continue to dig at the site found by... And time enough to launch a massive public relations campaign to save the lock. Pretty soon we had state representatives, state senators, we had newspaper reporters, we had uh, planes flying, helicopters flying overhead. The stop work order was extended. The city of New Haven won a bid to save the timbers, and the Department of Transportation gave $100,000 to finance the effort. I think New Haven's involvement absolutely was a turning point. It would have probably been dug up and hauled away uh, to the dump. The job of digging up the timbers belonged to City Councilman Tim Doyle. His first task was to keep them wet. If they dried out after being exposed to the air, they would fall apart. So he devised a system for spraying them with water from the ditch. Slowly, the timbers began to emerge. But where would they go? There were no funds to build a home for the lock in New Haven. Craig Leonard, project director for the city of New Haven, found a solution. He proposed submerging the timbers at an abandoned sewage treatment plant nearby. The tanks would be the perfect place to keep the timbers until a permanent home could be found. But the timbers were buoyant and would not sink. Incredibly, a nearby salvage yard had dozens of cement bathtubs the perfect size, weight, and shape to hold the timbers down. But how to prevent the still waters from becoming a breeding ground for mosquitoes and for algae that might damage the timbers? Tim Doyle's idea was to add goldfish to the tanks to eat the culprits. So we put in five bucks worth, and uh, right now you could probably hold a fish fry if you clean that place out. So there the timbers sat for years until the State Museum offered them a home in its new building. This is the only wooden canal lock that has been uncovered in the United States, perhaps in the world. But first, the timbers were shipped to South Carolina, where the wood was preserved so that it could withstand being exposed to air while on display inside the museum. It had taken 10 years and a lot of ingenuity to save the lock, but canal enthusiasts never lost hope. They were following in the footsteps of the perseverant Hoosiers before them. Some days we would be down in that excavation and we would think about those guys 150 years ago who were building this thing in the first place. And um, you could sympathize with them. They must have had days when it seemed like they were working on some impossible task that was never going to be finished. And yet they pulled through. We had a problem. We had very little money and we we're gonna make it work. So many things in life, you know, we look back at and we say, gee, I wish we'd have saved that. Gee, I wish we'd have done this. Well, in this particular situation, we did. And I think it's that passion for the preservation of the lives and for telling the story. It is amazing. It speaks, I think, to the love that a significant number of people in this state have for the canals and for the idea of the canals. 